So, we're going to start off with everyone's already got koha, what do we do next? So, I'm going to just briefly, this is kind of the agenda for my talk, I'll go through it quite fast because I know we're, we're compressed for time and I'll try and uh, go through it as fast as I can. So, um, just some statistics about koha. So, there's around, what's that, 10, 10 million lines of code in koha, including the translations. Um, 27,000 commits, so yeah, 4.6 commits a day, so you can see um, it's a lot of work gone into the software, 295 developers, over 16 years worth of development. If you estimate it using the, the Kokomo COCOMO um, model of software development that Olo do, it's, if you were to pay for that, it's about 10 and a half million US dollars of developers' time gone into the software. And, and that everyone gets for free. So, Koha. I'll just turn that one off. Oh, there we go. Koha um, means gift in Māori, like I said before, but it's a special kind of gift. It's called a reciprocal gift, or a gift with obligations. Say you were going to someone's house for dinner, the, the, you would take a gift and they would feed you. You know, it's a two-way thing. So koha, the idea of it's that as well. So you've been given a gift and now how about, you know, maybe you can give a little bit back. So that's what I'm going to talk about, talk about next. If I can move on. There we go. Um, so... Here's kind of what you as an individual can do. And a lot of you are doing that already. The first thing, speaking up, you're here. So that's, do, you've done that already. You can tick that off. You can go home and say, I've already committed, um, contributed to the Koha community. The other, the other thing is get more involved, like get involved locally, things like this. Then let the move for more locally to maybe regionally, then globally, then universally when we get a colony on Mars or something, but at the moment globally is good. Um, encourage freedom. Uh, there was a really good talk, the inaugural address today um, was fantastic and it, and it showed that there are a lot of more freedoms that libraries and library users have in India that, that at least I was aware of, some of the copyright exemptions. And um, as re users of free software, we can encourage other people to embrace that freedom as well. Um, we can sponsor developments. Um, that's an obvious one. Pay people like Amit, pay people in your local library, get students to do it, whatever, um, and do work on Koha that way. And the biggest, biggest, most useful thing you can do is test. Test lots, test new features, test your local customizations, test any other new ones, and report issues you find. Um, Software developers are the worst people to test the code they wrote because they wrote it and they know how it's supposed to work, so they test how it's supposed to work. What you need is someone who comes in and goes, what happens if I click over there and then type this and click there and it all breaks? You need people like that and library users and librarians are the best people to test library software. Back one more, please. Uh, hang on, I'll see if I can do it. There we go. So that was kind of next for individuals or institutions. I'm going to try and summarize an entire country of a billion people. So <laughs> I'm making big generalizations, so bear with me. Um, a really simple thing we can do here is localization. This is already well underway. Some of the things you've done for currency work and... Um, the language translations and stuff are done, but there's a lot more to be done. I know that there, there's a lot of languages spoken in India, and I think we're only translated into maybe one or two of them. Um, uh, we can... I'm, there's a lot of stuff I've heard today of features that you guys need that I haven't heard before, and I think that's a shame. So if... Though some way of getting the, those features that you need back up into the community so that the developers around the world are, are 
aware of it, and you'll find really interesting things like to do with the currency thing. Switzerland in the, in, is a surrounded by EU company, countries, but it uses Swiss francs, and, and, but pretty much everyone it deals with deals in euros. So they're constantly doing currency conversions in a kind of similar way to what you have to do. So what was a, something that was thought of was a local problem in India is actually a problem in you know, many countries. So that could be an upstream feature. Um, but if we don't know about these issues, we don't know that you want these features, we won't build them um, until I can invent mind reading, which <laughs> then uh, we, someone has to tell us. So that's a really good thing. And I think something like this conclave or even regional user groups is a really good way of summarizing those wish lists and then push them up. Um, I'll certainly be writing a big a blog post about everything I've heard today. Um, more patches. There's tons of smart, smart, smart people here doing really good work. And we need that work to benefit the rest of the world, not just India. So if we can push those patches up into the main core, you'll make your own life easier in the future too, because when you come to upgrade, you don't have to do all that work again. It's in the main release. More testers. I'm going to probably, it's a common theme you'll hear from me a lot over the next two days. It's a really, really valuable service testing um, features. Uh, I'll show probably, if I have time tomorrow, I'll show in the workshop the sandbox uh, facility that we have in Koha, which allows you to test a bug without having to have a running Koha yourself. You can go to a website, put in a bug number, it will apply the patch and you can test it and then you can say it works or it doesn't. So it means that all you need is a web browser to test it. Um, and again, India's already doing this quite well, and it's getting better all the time. There are people um, who are passionate about free software and software freedom and about open access to knowledge. I really like the, uh, the quote in the Koha Cat one that the, um, the aim of libraries is universal access to knowledge. And I think that's a really good aim, and it gels really well with the free software idea of the same thing. Right, so I'm going to briefly go through now what's next for Koha, the project. Um, these are just some of my ideas, and I, they're, bear in mind they're just mine, so we'll combine them with your wish list, and then we'll get a better roadmap. But I'm going to briefly touch on the developer workflow next, just to kind of explain how code gets into Koha, and maybe dismiss, demystify some of that, make it a little bit less scary. Um, one of the big things I think are useful for... Um, for Koha, well, one thing that I think that Koha can do well is respect its patrons' privacy. A lot of library systems don't do that, and I think Koha has a really good chance of doing that. So, l making things opt out or opt in, you know. Uh, metadata in other formats. You've probably all heard of BibFrame, but there's all the linked data and all these other formats. The archivists do everything in their own special way. You've got uh, all sorts of GIS data, and uh, in New Zealand we have a whole lot of cemetery databases of you know, like gravestones and who the person was, and these are all in different formats. And but if you combine them together, you create a really good repository of knowledge about your local area. So Koha being able to understand those formats as well as just Mark would be good. Um, Coral integration, optimization, and what does this feature mean? So I'm going to kind of touch on each of them a little bit more. If I can click. Okay. So this is a oh, this is this is the I got to try and talk down like that. This is the way um, a, a general patch will get into Core Hub. So the first thing you want to do is actually lodge an enhancement or a bug request on the bug tracker. It's easy to remember, it's bugs.koha-community.org. Uh, it's open to anyone, you just, you just need an email address to sign up. Um, the first thing they actually do is actually to search on there and see if someone already hasn't lodged it. If you're lucky, someone's already working on it. Um, after that, a patch or patches will be submitted, so someone will do the work, they'll submit it then someone other than the person who, who wrote the patch 
or the person it was written for has to sign off on it. So say uh, I was working for a library here, they asked me to write a patch to do uh, braille on patron cards or something like that. I did the work for them. Someone other than they or me have to test it. So it has to be someone independent um, because both of us have a vested interest in, in it passing the tests. Um, if, it, if it passes, then the QA person has to test it, uh, the QA team. There's six people on the team now. Um, and they test for things not only does it work, but they test to make sure it doesn't break something else. Like there's nothing worse than you adding a new feature and then you end up breaking three old ones that people were using. They also test for things like code quality to make sure that the, um, the, the work is maintainable and, and well commented. Then the release manager will push it. Uh, and if it's a bug fix, then the release maintainer will pull that from that branch into their one and then there'll be a release. Like I said before this morning, we do major releases six months, but we do bug fix releases every month. And they, should, they don't contain any changes, they just fix bugs. So the idea is that it's easy to upgrade to those. So that's kind of the workflow. So yeah, privacy audit, to talk a little bit more about this. Um, I think in this, the, it certainly, it may not be as relevant here, but it's quite relevant in uh, the US and New Zealand and a few other countries that are part of uh, the Five Eyes program. In the US, at least, the FBI do not need a warrant to take data out of a library system. They can walk into a library and they can say, give us all of your borrower records and all their circulation history, and you have to give it to them. Um, so I think it should be opt-in whether that's kept. So as a, as a user in those countries, if that's how your regime works, you can say, look, I don't want you to keep my history. After I return the book, then delete my records, those kind of things. Also, uh, there's a lot, this will be uh, pertinent to the talk later on about RFID. Um, most RFID setups, uh, and this is not the fault of the RFID at all, use uh, SIP2 to talk to uh, uh, ILS. SIP2 is a protocol that was developed uh, predating the internet. It was a uh, and it does, so it doesn't actually do anything like encryption or anything like that. So if you are just doing self-check machine to a library system, it doesn't have to be Koha, it could be any of them, that data flows in the clear. And that contains people's addresses, it contains perhaps the password of library staff and those kind of things. So there's work to do around Koha. Koha itself already encrypts that by default, but a lot of people don't set that up. Um, I won't belabor that one too much. Um, this is one of my favorite photos. I, I, I don't want us to keep adding more different Mark flavors because the world is slowly moving away from Mark. You know, there are, there are much more, f Mark is awesome when it was written in 1969 when disk space was really expensive and transmission was expensive and you wanted to compress things and you wanted fixed length fields and, and you didn't have things like uh, AVI files. There's a whole lot of stuff that you can't really adequately describe in Mark because it didn't exist. Oh, it didn't, um, uh, I will just leave it there. <laughs> no, it didn't exist when they were coming up with it. Um, so it, it's time is kind of due. So we want to be able to support other things. So there's a lot of work on Koha being done around Elasticsearch as the search engine. Elasticsearch doesn't care what type of data you throw at it as long as you tell it what it is when you're indexing. So you can index Mark, uh, Dublin Core, a phone book, whatever you want as long as you describe that data as you're indexing it. So it should allow us to do that kind of stuff. So I won't talk about this too much, but this is something that I think is really important. Um, libraries are more and more around the world moving to electronic resources, and to, and to deal with electronic resources, you have to deal with um, hundreds of different licenses, and you have to manage what piece of, which journal is under which license, linked to what. There are some really good tools to do that. I'm gonna be talking about them tonight, so I'll just kind of leave it there, but integrating them with Koha is a, um, is I think something that we really need to do. 
because I know, yeah, pretty much everywhere in the world, journals now are primarily published electronically first, and getting a print copy of a journal is quite rare. Uh, more speed. Um, you, we always want this. The, the last three or four years, we've put a lot of new features into Koha. Every time you put a new feature in, there's a chance that you slow some things down. We've slowed it down a bit. Uh, we've sped it up again a bit, but we can speed it up a lot more. Um, and as internet is faster, and as people's patient, patience decreases, um, I think each generation is a little more impatient than the one before it, so we need to keep reducing that speed. And people want their search results to be bang. They don't, you know, they want it to be Google fast. They don't want it to be um, Lipsis fast or, <laughs> or Koha at the moment fast. They want it to be as fast as you get results out of Google. And I think that that's something that we should keep in mind and that most of us either work in libraries or for libraries, but our real end users are not the librarians. I mean, there are big real end users are the people who use the library. And so whatever we do, we should be thinking in the back of our heads, how does this help the end user? And I mean, there's a, you can do a lot of work over changing catalog interfaces all the time, but do we want to expend that much effort in there if we could be doing something on the OPAC that would help the end user a bit better? Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I went through it kind of fast because I knew we were running tight on time. Well, Yep. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, don't ask those questions, but only this particular. Uh, uh, this thing you, you you are free to ask any questions because this is very very important. What is the future of Koha, etc. Yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, my very first question is, how far uh, this uh, discovery f means uh, all sort of uh, electronic resources? Uh, how can we integrate uh, this in Koha? For example, we have catalog. Along yep. with that, we subscribe to materials. Our IRs are there. Many other. Things. Can we integrate them together to have a single? Search window. The, the answer is yes. Um, but So the question, I don't know if anyone, everyone heard it, was how, we've got all these other sources of information. Uh, how can we integrate them into Koha to have a single uh, search box? Um, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the EBSCO work we've done for Koha already. There's an EBSCO plugin. You can search the EDS and Koha and it will turn all the results in Koha. And we're working on trying to do more and more of that. This is where moving away from just understanding Mark is really important because m most other sources are not Mark. So we need to be able to have a, an indexing system that can index all these different sorts of data and provide a consistent, understandable interface to the user. Will it affect the database functionality? It shouldn't. It, 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 it potentially, <laughs> potentially it could. Um, but it shouldn't because it's, um, it, it, no, it would be, we'd, you'd still have your separate information, it would just be an interface, a search layer, and you would still click on and end up over in your database in the end anyway. But it'd be, it makes sense to me, rather than putting a discovery layer on top of Koha, to make Koha be the discovery layer, and that's where we're trying to work, work towards. Yeah, uh, it's good that we are also thinking about the uh, privacy issues of our patrons. But the current structure of Koha allows, means there are, it's prone to have a hacking possibility. I can easily inject a SQL statement in PL, uh, in any of the Perl language and get the other patrons data also. Yeah. And when we are planning to use such a huge kind of a system in a, across a global, how are we, are we working something about the patrons membership uh, data privacy because yeah. in current position it's very easy for anybody to just get the other patrons details also without getting in touch with the librarians. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so um, that's a good point. If, if someone has access to the server that's running it, they could get into the database server and get the data out there. Um, there are ways around it. 
Um, we're doing what what we do at, at Catalyst, where I work, is we run that that database on an encrypted partition. So, uh, if someone's got access to that, you're already in big trouble. Um, but what we what we what we looked at doing was encrypting the database itself. The, the downside of that is a speed issue. So we have to work on the technical things, but definitely. Um, the good thing is Catrin in uh, the QA manager, Germany has really strict privacy laws. So Koha has to comply with those to be installed in German libraries. So that's driving a lot of this privacy stuff. It's certainly one of my passions as well. I, I'd like to be able to say that Koha is the most privacy-respecting ILMS out there. So we're working on that. And if you have any suggestions on ways we could achieve that as well, please feel free to email them through or chat to me at lunch or something. Okay. Is there any plan to make the librarians themselves independently manage their Koha without the help of service providers? Lots of libraries do that, uh, but they do need some technical, and uh, at the moment they still need some uh, technical expertise in house somewhere. The, the, the hard part of managing Koha from not a librarian person is not so much managing Koha, it's managing the server that Koha is on. So you still need, you need someone who knows how to do uh, uh, operating system upgrades, how to reply security patches, all those kind of things. That's the tricky thing. Um, if you have someone in-house that can do that, that's fine. The majority of people using Koha don't use a support provider. So if you think about that, the majority in the world of people have done it themselves. Um, having said that, most uh, academic institutions or public libraries or stuff will use a support provider because that's what they've always done. They don't have those skills in-house. Um, in New Zealand, Five of the public libraries run their own Koha server. Three of the ones, we host them for them. It's kind of, we're, we're trying to always make it a little bit easier. But there is still going to need to be some kind of understanding of how to maintain a server. That's, that's the most important thing. Because if that server is unmaintained, it doesn't matter how good Koha is if the server itself crashes underneath, if, if, if that makes sense. So you need someone to do that. And then if we make Koha itself, uh, as easily. So with the Elastic Search, we're going to move all the indexes into an editable uh, thing and part of the Koha interface. So if you want to make the title be weighted higher than the author in your search results, you can change them yourself without needing to get on the server. So we're trying to move that, but I don't think there'll ever be a time, unless we sell like a, an appliance or something, where you can not have someone with a little bit of technical expertise to at least look after the server or the hosting provider or whatever. Does that kind of answer your question? You can. I think that in the library domain, uh, two, three things are coming up very quickly and emerging uh, things. One is the linked open data. Mm -hmm. Second is the SKOS, uh, you know, simple knowledge organization system. Right. Now, do you have in fact, not you, we have yep. actually any plan to integrate, uh, uh, you know, like linked open data because the entire DDC uh, came up on, uh, uh, through DOE.info as linked open data. Yeah. And most of the thesauras and other knowledge discovery tools That's are right. available in SQS yeah. format. Yeah. But I tried, uh, you know, something uh, to integrate the Koha catalog interface with the external thesauras by using another software called Tematrace. Okay. But there, uh, the problem is that the external linking mechanism is not quite available in Koha. Yeah. So what, what, are, what is our thinking in that particular thing? So the, the good news is that, and they're massively into linked open data, and so they're doing a lot of work. Um, if I had the internet, I could show you some of the things, but they've, they have a, a website um, where they've done a whole lot of work of mark to RDF and RDF to mark round tripping. So... And there's a really uh, smart guy called Magnus Inga, who's an, another Norwegian who's worked a lot on that. Um, there's a thing he's made, a proof of concept called Semantic Koha. So it's like Semantic Koha, um, which is doing that kind of stuff. And again, that's where this elastic search will kind of help us because we can ingest. There are, there's a, a project called Katmandu, like, like the mountains, or like the place, and with a, but with a C instead, that does 
all of these are the heavy work of transitioning from different be it RDF triples or uh, Dublin Core or whatever to other formats. That's being built in with the Elastic Search, and it should allow us to do the linkages stuff. Um, if you catch me I will, at lunchtime, I'll try and show you some on my laptop if we can. Yeah. Wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, with respect to Koha features, uh, especially the uh, acquisition part, it's uh, wonderful. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, serial model, mm -hmm. when you compare to the competitors or you can say commercial or like open source other vendors, uh, somewhere I think uh, if you can spend some time or like your developers who are working about 295, if you can put about 5 people or some 10 people to study what other people are doing yeah. or vice versa, you can just uh, collect the input from uh, like uh, experts like uh, uh, various parts of the country and try to integrate uh, those uh, uh, inputs to enhance the feature. Yeah. Okay. Are there any plan in this regard? There, there, the, the, the thing with serials is that I think the problem with, with the, the mistake we've made is we've tried to make a serials module that works for everyone. And it's not actually really possible. What we should be doing is we should have uh, academic serials, we should have a law serials, we should have maybe a corporate serials, they all do it slightly differently and trying to make them all work together, you end up with one size fits no one um, instead of a one size fits all. So I think uh, splitting them out into separate kind of things would make a lot of sense. And something that would be fantastic and would help that a lot is that second idea you touched on. If someone, like myself, I have no library training. I only know what people tell me. So if there was a document that said, this is how we need, like, you click here, this should happen. You put the prediction pattern in, this should happen. Step, 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 step. A recipe, then we can follow that and, and make it happen. And that's something that, that librarians can do. Uh, they can write those kind of specifications for us on the wiki, and then we can work through, get some discussion going, because you might get, you'll say, it needs to do this, this, and this, and then someone from Vietnam will say, no, it can't do that, it has to do this, and then we end up with something that hopefully works for everyone at the end. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I have one more question. Yep. Uh, nowadays, actually, mo most of the libraries or librarians maintain two uh, like uh, management, uh, uh, library management packages, one for like cataloging and another for uh, the digital content. Uh, do you have any kind of plan where like, for example, DSpace, which manages the institutional repositories or like any other open source, Greenstone and all those things. Yeah. Uh, for the end user, uh, what libraries does, it doesn't make much difference. As a user, if you ask me what exactly I want, I want everything in one finger touch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where you can, one of the libraries, uh, so library science law says, save the time of the user as well as the staff yeah. members. If you create a parallel platform for various content for various uh, uh, clicks, so that is not going to save, rather yeah. than it is going to consume time. Yeah. So if it is not going, if you are not already, it is not there in the plan, I request you to add uh, to your wish list where you can have an integrated yep. uh, platform where for anything, everything across the globe, yep. which user want can, uh, uh, if anybody says what is, where should we search or what should be uh, deployed, everyone should say that Koha. Yep. Yeah, that, and that's what, yeah, that's where definitely we want to go. And we kind of touched on that with the first question that, uh, and that's where I think in the, in the presentation this morning I had the RESTful API. Having a documented, uh, published, stable API that's versioned, we can then work with the DSpace developers and the Islandora developers such that when you load something into DSpace, it can push that record through as a catalog record straight into Koha without a librarian or someone else having to do that. Maybe they check it, maybe add a little bit, but not have to catalog everything. Um, that's for the open source ones, they're an easier problem to solve. The proprietary ones, we depend on them having an API we can talk to. So we've done a lot of work with EBSCO, they're very open source friendly. Um, and we've done a lot of work with Overdrive, who also are, they understand that more people will buy their services if they can use them easier. Um, but there are some other op uh, proprietary ones that we'll have, have to talk with more, try to convince them that, that putting their stuff in Koha is good. Thank you. Yeah given us the taste of champagne still we need to drink
but we have still lot more time to drink today afternoon and tomorrow he will be with us uh, uh, the uh, the presenters in the um, case studies had also put the slides on uh, wish list so i have actually printed them and i am going to pass them on to uh, chris as well he is going to be assisted by amit so they will uh, try to give the answers for that and uh, i would like to mention here that we are not going to have any presentations uh, in the wish list category earlier we had thought of doing it um, now i i know it's uh, the session will go on its own once the, the questions are um, being allowed to ask that's it okay anyway uh, be prepared to have some wish list write in a slip you can also ask questions directly absolutely no problem on that and uh, i thank chris for having given a wonderful presentation um and um, we are going to have him up, um, today and tomorrow as well so thank you chris on behalf of the organizers